headquarters of the World Jewish Congress here in New York City. I'm thrilled to be here today. My name is Melissa Jane Kronfeld, and I am a PhD student at Rutgers University, and I work in social impact strategy. I'm also a member of the JD Corps. Um, and for those of you who are just joining us for the first time today, um, the World Jewish Congress is an international organization that represents Jewish communities and groups um, in over a hundred different countries. We advocate on behalf of these groups to governments, parliaments, people of other faiths, international organizations, and governing bodies around the world. Um, we exist because we believe that all Jews have a responsibility for one another, and since our founding in 1936, we have always taken this responsibility very gravely. And we fight for Jewish rights and against Jewish hatred wherever it rears its ugly head. Um, the JD Corps, which I'm honored and humbled to be a member of, is our flagship program where we have over 200 young professionals working on public policy and through diplomatic channels in over 40 countries. Um, and we work to advance the interests of the World Jewish Congress and end anti-Israel and anti-Jewish hatred. I am thrilled to be with Dr. Richard Landis today for our webinar series. And if this is the first time you've been in our webinar series, uh, we work with scholars and experts in their field to discuss those issues that are most important to the Congress, like anti-Semitism, anti-Israel delegitimization, and other topics related to the work of the JD Corps. Uh, Dr. Richard Landis, uh, a friend and uh, a scholar and a colleague, is an American historian and author at Bar Ilan University, and he uh, focuses his work on millennialism and media coverage of the Arab-Israeli conflict. Which is a millennial war. <laughs> exactly. And I am uh, thrilled to have you here today. This is the second conversation that you and I have had the opportunity to have just in the past year. Um, and we're going to talk today about a topic that's super important and relevant to the world that we're living in today, and that's what Pollywood is. Um, it's a term that you coined to describe how Palestinians disguise anti-Israel propaganda as legitimate news. And you made a documentary, and everyone should watch, it's about 18 minutes long, you can find it on YouTube. Um, and you talk about Pollywood and you, and you show what Pollywood is. And you say in the documentary that sometimes it's very difficult to separate fact from fiction. So long before people were talking about fake news and long before fake news right. was trending on Twitter, you were talking about Pollywood. So I'd love to start today by asking you, what is Pollywood? Uh, how and why did you coin the term? And then maybe give us a broader context gotcha. of the, right. the words that we'll be discussing today. So um, it starts with the story of Muhammad Adura, this uh, young boy, 12-year-old boy, who was allegedly gunned down either in a crossfire or in cold blood by the IDF at Netzarim Junction on the 30th of September 2000. Uh, so right at the beginning of the Intifada. And this image that was then was shot by a Palestinian cameraman at Netzarim Junction sent to Charles Anderlin, who was one of the most prominent uh, Western correspondents at uh, France to television, and they ran it as a story of the boy being the target of fire coming from the Israeli position. And um, it did enormous damage. I mean, it, it basically shifted the world opinion against Israel on a massive scale. Uh, and I think anybody who sort of came to consciousness, uh, you know, anybody who was younger than say 15 or 16 in 2000, has grown up in a world that's been shaped by this accusation, which is really the first blood libel of the 21st century. And I was aware of its impact, and I was aware, as a medievalist, I was aware that it was operating as a blood libel. I didn't know it was a fake. And then in 2003, there was an article by uh, James Fallows and the uh, Atlantic Monthly, in which he interviewed the researcher who had looked into it, and uh, although Fallows didn't say it was a fake, it was clear enough to me from the evidence that it was. So being a good medievalist, I went to uh, Israel to find out uh, what's the story behind this, see the evidence. And I'm sitting there looking at the footage, not of uh, this Palestinian cameraman who worked for France too, but another Palestinian cameraman who worked for Reuters. And we had two hours worth of his footage. And it was full of fakes, you know, full of people who uh, um, 
are you know running and and fall but you can see their hands breaking the fall and then everybody runs and picks them up and throws them into an ambulance the ambulance goes off and they're doing this right in front of the Israelis um, and then I got the opportunity which was not often accorded to anybody who was critical to view Talal Abu Rahman's footage and I remember it was October 31st uh, 2003 and I see this footage and it was even worse than the Reuters guy. It was just pure fake. At one point, one guy grabbed his leg and was, oh, you know, and only little kids came around. He was a big, fat guy. They weren't about to pick him up, and he sort of shooed him away and then walked away without a hitch. And I said to, uh, I, I said to Andel, oh, this looks fake. He says, all this stuff looks fake. And he says, yeah, they do it all the time. It's a cultural thing. So here I am talking to Charles Henri de la Orientalist, mm -hmm. um, and I realized at that moment that not only do they fake, I already knew that, but the Western press has no problem with these fakes. They take them and they edit them so you don't see the footage that makes it clear it's a fake, and they string together these sight bites. Uh, and they tell a Palestinian story about huge numbers of casualties and so on and so forth. And as I was walking out of the building, I thought, it's an industry. It's like Bollywood, it's Pallywood. So that's how I came to the term. And the reason that I made the Pallywood movie, it's really part of a three-part series. There's Pallywood, Aldura, the making of an icon, and Icon of Hatred. And so the reason I did Pallywood before I did Aldura was because I would, it was inconceivable to people when I was talking to them that the Palestinians would fake this. And I'd say to them, you know, there are five possibilities. Uh, Israelis killed them on purpose, Israelis killed them by accident, Palestinians killed them by accident, Palestinians killed them on purpose, and, and nobody said it could be faked. Everybody would, you know, they, they couldn't think, or they'd say the UN, the, 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 <laughs> the Red, Red Cross ambulance killed them or something. Uh, but they just assumed that he was killed, and they assumed that uh, what the footage they were seeing was somehow real journalism. And of course, Charles Andela was defending his journalist and saying mm -hmm. he's professional and so on and so forth. So I did Pallywood first just to break people into the idea that Palestinians, there's a, there's a pickup game on the street at these demonstrations where if you put in a successful uh, performance of being injured and you're thrown into an ambulance and taken away, then you have a chance of making TV. Um, so, you know, on one level it was kind of funny, um, but the impact is huge. Yeah, it almost seems like the race for millennials to get on reality TV shows here yeah, yeah, yeah. in America like, and these dating shows to be Bachelor right, or Bachelorette, right, right, but rather right, in the right, Palestinian right. territories, it's about it's being, about being, on being the a next victim. bombing victim. It's right. about being a victim. So um, I'm wondering if you could tell me a bit about um, how you said in the documentary that, that Hollywood works. So yeah. how does it work? How does it influence the media? And as a result, how does it influence the broader public perceptions right. of Israel, uh, both in, in the Middle East and here in the United right. States and in Europe? Right. Well, most of Hollywood is B-roll. Mm -hmm. In other words, yeah. it's, you know, the background music to, to Bob Simon saying, you know, at Netzerim Junction, 100 people were killed. No, one person was mm -hmm. killed, and it was a PA guy who was firing at the Israelis. Right. Um, so this whole narrative of the massive assault of the Israeli army on Palestinian civilians, which really came out two years later in the Janine operation and the accusation of a massacre there, um, all of that is, if you will, the ground is prepared because people see this, take it seriously, think it's a depiction of reality, um, and therefore, they're ready to believe that all these casualty statistics they hear are real. I was in Andelin's office at one point, and he shows me a fax from a hospital that a Palestinian was killed, uh, shot in the back. And I said, um, by Israelis. And I said, how do they know that? You know, and he looked at me like, what, you think Palestinians would shoot a kid in the back? It must be Israelis. So you have this sort of default mode, which really 
help lock in this notion of the Israeli Goliath and the Palestinian David, which is an inversion not only of a previous take, but it's an inversion like Pollywood of reality. I mean, the striking thing about Pollywood is you got these guys doing this in front of the Israeli position. So, you know, if the Israelis are firing at them, why are they bringing a wounded person back in front of the Israeli position and shoving them into an ambulance there? So, um, so I think the impact is enormous, and I think that essentially what it's done is led to the emergence of what uh, some of my colleagues and I call lethal journalism. Mm -hmm. And lethal journalism is essentially when you run one side's war propaganda as news. So essentially the war propaganda is these what Nietzsche Polar calls these lethal narratives. And lethal narratives are essentially stories about malevolent, deliberate murder of civilians that are designed to create outrage, if not hatred, of the people who are doing it and to, you know, incite your side to fight harder, to get revenge for all these terrible things. And, you know, Bin Laden used the Aldura footage almost immediately mm -hmm. uh, in, in his uh, call for global jihad. So you have on the one hand this, this war propaganda of lethal narratives, and you have the media who are trimming it, clipping it, putting it together, and presenting it as news to the West, which is catastrophic for Israelis. Mm -hmm. It's catastrophic for Palestinians who want peace. I mean, uh, I was part of a dialogue group before 2000. After 2000, it was over. There, was no, there were no dialogue right. groups. The contact between Israelis and Palestinians has just about disappeared. And when you see conversations between Israelis and Palestinians, the Palestinians are just all about these accusations that appear in the media. And they'll say, one of the things that they love to say about al is the whole world saw it. That proves that we're right. So, um, but there's an even bigger victim in this, uh, or shall we say a wider victim in this, and that's the West itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're running, they think they're running, they think they're siding with Palestinian nationalists who want their own state on the West Bank. Mm -hmm. And if you listen carefully to journalists talk about the future Palestinian state or the viable Palestinian state or what Palestinians want for a state, they're thinking West Bank. Mm -hmm. It's clear if you listen to Palestinians, including high officials in the PLO, PA, you name it, they're thinking, you know, the shoreline, not the green line. And so you have this situation where they're misreading the conflict. They think it's about uh, restrained Palestinian nationalism that just wants the West Bank, and if only Israel would give it to them, everything would be okay. Um, and in fact, what they're doing is they're running war propaganda, which is being used by global jihadis like bin Laden and others, systematically to fan the flames of the hatred of the West. Mm -hmm. So through the course of the 21st century, this young century, still young, um, we've had a series, starting with the al Dura affair and the outbreak of the Antifada, 2002 Janine, 2005 Gaza Beach, 2006 the Lebanon War, 2008-9 the uh, cast lead, um, 2010, um, I forget the name of it, Protective another edge. Protective Edge. Uh, then in 2012 was the Mavi Marmara incident. Then in 2014 was, um, I think that the was Protective 2014. Protective Edge was 2014, 20, yeah, no, 2010 right. it was not. Right, so you have all of these incidents that each time they happen, the media goes in and tells the story of Palestinian suffering. And they think that what they're doing is they're stopping the violence because if they can get outrage in the West at the poor Palestinian suffering, then diplomatic pressure will force the Israelis to stand down and it will be the end of the violence and they've saved lives. Mm -hmm. What they're doing, in fact, is spreading throughout the world, but particularly throughout the Muslim world, um, you know, propaganda for jihadi warfare. And the fact that, you know, the Europeans try as much as possible to steer clear of supporting Israel, in their minds, 
any support for Israel, mm -hmm. any even even handedness is viewed as a betrayal of their cause and, and so on. So it's a it's a very I would call it foolish, self destructive pattern of reporting that has taken in the mainstream Western news media since 2000 uh, and has done immense damage over the last 17 years. You make a great point. The, the media narrative um, on, on, the, on the operations that Israel leads into the Palestinian territories are highly skewed. You never see stories about how we are the only military in history that sends in more supplies and aids right. during wartime right. to an enemy That's than it. we actually do. <laughs> right. Military troops and gear we right. bring right. more into right. than harm it is done. And the level and extent to which our military goes to knocking on doors and informing individuals in the communities, yeah. setting up um, me medical tents within a mile of any bomb zone to save individuals that refuse to right. comply with orders to evacuate. Right. Those stories really don't refuse make. to comply or are not allowed to. Or not allowed to, of course. I shouldn't say right. that there's all right. refusal. As many times they right. are captors of, of their right. own. Um, people They're certainly not allowed into the tunnels. <laughs> uh, yeah. Absolutely, I and mean, that's a fantastic point. Um, so, incidentally, yeah. uh, the, to 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 pursue your point there, the irony here, and it's an irony that's replicated in a number of different places as well. The irony here is that the Israelis are by far the most studiously careful army about not killing mm -hmm. enemy civilians. I'm a medievalist. Back in my day, yes. <laughs> armies bragged about killing right. civilians. And torturing, and right. yes, that right. was key so, to warfare. So they go out of their way. Their record, and particularly Jenin, um, is the most extraordinary record of a, a sort of two or three to one combatant to civilian casualties in urban warfare. Unheard of. There's nothing like it on record. Mm -hmm. Um, and in fact, I've heard some terrible things about American involvement and the taking of Raqqa and uh, other cities in Iraq right now with huge civilian damage for a small number of uh, combatants. Um, so on the one hand, you have the Israelis who are the leading edge of protecting enemy civilians, and that is literally inverted by this coverage so that Israel has a reputation as being one of the most brutal armies in the planet. Despite making the Geneva Accords biblical scripture essentially right. for our, for right. our operations. Right. And, and Americans, I mean I've heard this from a number of sources, both Israelis who, who do army exercises with the Americans and from Americans in the military and involved in the military that the Americans feel enormously put upon by these exceptionally high levels of restraint in firepower mm -hmm. in order not to harm civilians. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. To think there was a lot of uh, upset about the only shoot if shot at in, in right. Israel is don't shoot even when shot at. Right. Um, so <laughs> so um, obviously uh, the American military operates um, with a tiny bit more lenient. So I guess the, the question, the next question would be is, you know, we've um, spoken, you've given some recent examples of Hollywood. So I, I'm curious, have we seen Hollywood techniques being exported to other conflicts? Do we see this, or is this unique to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? It's not unique at all, yeah. although I do think that it, um, you know, this is the sort of crucible of the technique. Mm -hmm. um, you saw it, for example, in Iraq. Um, there was a really stunning incident of um, uh, the case of the torture at what prison was it? Abu Ghraib. Uh, Abu Ghraib. And so uh, the Arabs actually ran a fake story about um, sexual torture which was taken from a pornographic movie and ran it and uh, the media didn't adopt it but uh, the Boston Globe actually interviewed a guy who had this footage or this a picture of this on his display board which the the Boston will brand and mind you that was like three weeks after I had spoken with the foreign editor about Hollywood and said watch out for fakes um, the story of flushing toilets down the Korans down the uh, toilet and um, at Guantanamo and so on all of these are examples of uh, foreign accusations that get run as news by Western media. Um, 
I do think that it is a much more widely used technique. I haven't actually gone into it, uh, into where it's spread, but um, look, I, there was there was fake news back in the anti-war demonstrations in the late 60s, mm -hmm. you know. I remember you, you wait until the cameras show up and then you start demonstrating and and you get, uh, you you provoke violence and you get it pictured and so on. But this is, really takes it to a new level. Hollywood takes it to a new level. It's really deliberate and it's, on some level, it's almost unthinkable for Westerners. You know, we, we just, we can't imagine, we can imagine the media twisting and this mm -hmm. and that, but we can't imagine the media actually using outright fakes and presenting them as news. And yet, in the Middle East, in the Arab-Israeli conflict, this is done constantly. Yeah, the only other example that comes to my mind would be Russia and Chechnya. Um, there's, there's a lot of manipulation of news oh, media sure there on behalf of the government and inciting and staging sure so to, to, right, to right. validate their uh, right. very strong-handed right. uh, strategy right. against it's Chechnya. It's war rebels. propaganda. Yeah. So I, I'm curious then, um, what is the most effective response to Hollywood? And, I, and I'd love to look at this from two different angles. Mm -hmm. Really, what is an effective response from uh, people, civilians more generally, particularly Jews and Jewish millennials? Right. And then what response um, to the media? How can we advise the media to be right. careful of this? We can't send you to the bureau of every Middle right. East major right. paper right. and give them a breakdown. It won't, but it won't help. Probably won't. I, I mean, I went. <laughs> you know, I, in fact, I remember going to ABC. And I talked with a guy at ABC, and I showed him the footage and stuff. And I and I thought, you know, ABC oh, is a very um, legitimate news outlet. Well, and it's also a rival of uh, other news outlets. So you know, this is this is a story. And the guy said to me, "I don't think there's much appetite for this here." And that's really, you know, the, it, what I've learned is you cannot talk this one out. Because, uh, as I put it, the, the, the lineup of news that we see is like the filings, metal filings on a table, and underneath is a magnet that's uh, creating a force field that lines them up, and you can push them out of the force field, but they'll just move right back. And that force field is, I think, pervasive intimidation of the Western media by the Palestinians. We saw it in 9-11. Um, somebody actually just posted the pictures of Palestinians celebrating 9-11 and handing out candies and so on. And when, I think it was CNN, took this footage and ran it, they got a call saying either you take it down or we cannot protect your reporters. Okay? And this is across the boards, the use of the, the refusal to use terrorism to refer to these incidents, including 9-11 mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. Reuters and BBC, the refusal to use terrorism and so on, all of these, when you look at the reasons that are given, uh, reflect this fear of retaliation against reporters. Mm -hmm. And the reporters, you know, how do they deal with it? On the one hand, they deal with it by being compliant. Mm -hmm. In other words, you talk to reporters, talk to uh, Jody Rudorn about this, you, know, you talk to reporters and they say, there's no intimidation, I haven't, and I said, well, you haven't said anything mm -hmm. that's going yeah. to trigger the violence. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as long as you're good boys and girls, you don't feel intimidation, they love you. Um, so, on the one hand, there's that, and then I think there's another thing which is really depressing and really clear in the case of somebody like Charles Ondela, but I think true of most reporters that I've had the misfortune to talk to, and that is a kind of cowardly narcissism mm -hmm. in which on the one hand, they can't admit to themselves that they've been intimidated, mm -hmm. and they certainly can't admit to their public that they've been intimidated. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, they become advocates. Mm -hmm. And they are open advocates of the Palestinians. You know, this is like um, Bob Simon has this comment uh, in the middle in his piece on Al Dura. He says, "In the Middle East, one picture can be worth a thousand weapons." Right. And I, I would, I would say to journalists, you know, I get the impression that you think, well, Israel has all the weapons, so I'm going to even the playing field by giving the Palestinians the PR victory. Mm -hmm. And they said, absolutely, it's mm -hmm. weapons of the week, you mm -hmm. know. And I said, but do you realize the degree to which you are fomenting war with this attitude? And basically, they won't say it, but the last thing they want is for Israel to win. Mm -hmm. 
right? And it's good business to have the war. You know, every two years you get this flood of lethal journalists coming in and depicting to the whole world how Muslims, they think they're depicting how Palestinians are being victimized. In the Muslim world, in the Ummah, they're looking at this and saying, this is how Muslims are being victimized. Mm -hmm. So the very same people who are telling us, don't use the word radical Islam because you'll offend people and you'll radicalize them and you're playing into the hands of the jihadis who are saying there's a war between the West and Islam and, and we don't want to play into that war. Everything they do in covering the Arab-Israeli conflict contributes to precisely that thing. So they end up doing a, a sort of double whammy on the West. On the one hand, they won't talk about Islamic violence, mm -hmm. qua Islamic, and on the other hand, they constantly portray Islamic propaganda that's intended to mobilize jihadi violence, mm -hmm. which is catastrophic, mm -hmm. and I think that's one of the reasons why we're in such bad shape. And it's also the co-option of international organizations in Tuvia Tenenbaum's book, Catch the Jew. He writes a whole chapter. Now he goes and he sees the staging mm -hmm. of the rock throwing. Mm -hmm. He speaks to the Israelis. They say, we meet here right. once a week. They throw the right. rocks. We allow them to do it for as long as we can. Right. When the rocks right. get bigger, we right. set off a tear gas. Right. And in the incident that he had seen, it was um, an international organization was there. And, and they had tried to move this woman from the international organization out of the way. Right. They had tried over and over again, and uh, she would not move. Right. It got to the point where she became violent towards the soldiers right, right. so they detained her they took her and they gently put her on the ground and right. they detained her but the only picture that made the media Absolutely. was the three Israeli right. soldiers with guns pointed right. at a very small French woman from an international agency right. on the ground and the whole world exploded and in BBC it was the one that published those pictures and in the book Tuvia, Tuvia goes back and he, and he asks and he's you know right. this this was not what happened you know right. I that was not at all what happened. She was given numerous right, warnings. Right, And this happens with such frequency uh, and such consistency that it's very hard for people to sort of process this, you know, it, it, because you end up, in order to get them to call this into question, you end up provoking uh, a great deal of resistance, if not hostility. Um, I remember having a Twitter exchange with one reporter who was just you know, accusing me of being heartless because I basically suggested, and of course, um, you know, somebody said, uh, what you do in these cases is, is you turn the statement into an extreme and then you attack it. So um, I'm not saying that all the violence against Palestinians is Pallywood, and I'm not saying that there is no Palestinian suffering, but they say, you're denying Palestinian suffering, and as a result of denying Palestinian suffering, you lack all empathy, and you're blaming the victim, and you're a disgusting person. And that will lead me to my next question, but if you are just joining us right now, I'm Melissa Jane Kronfeld with the World Jewish Congress JD Corps, and I'm here with Dr. Richard Landis from Bar Ilan University, discussing the role of Hollywood um, in the world today. So how do you respond to accusations like that? I know I get them all the time. You're not empathetic right, to the Palestinian right, people. You don't right, care. Right. Uh, as a Jew, you're taking a side because you're yeah. Jewish. Um, you know, how do you respond to that, and how would you um, recommend that uh, individuals like myself and others respond to those accusations? So, before I answer your question, I just want to clarify something. I, I don't teach at Bar Ilan. I'm, I'm, I'm a senior fellow. I'm a senior fellow at the Center for International Communication. Um, I'm retired Even from the U, where I was a medieval <laughs> history professor. Um, so, how do I handle those accusations? Well, the first thing I say is. My empathy goes out to Palestinians who want to live in peace, and they're the ones who are being screwed by this stuff. So, you know, when you empathize with people who lie about how vicious the Israelis are and drum up the, the tom-toms of war in order to, uh, um, you know, support a quote-unquote liberation movement, what you're doing is you're screwing the Palestinians. And you're the one who lacks empathy for all the people who lose out when you adopt the narrative of the people who are victimizing the Palestinian mm -hmm. people, which is their leadership. They're the ones who are constantly pummeling them with genocidal hate uh, messages from the pulpit, which the Nazis never did. There's no case of, that I know of of a Nazi priest or minister calling for genocide from the pulpit. This is a daily event in the Palestinian territories. 
um, PA and Hamas. It's not, you know, Kerry in his speech says uh, Hamas is, you know, uh, terrible and so on and so forth, but the PA is okay. No, the PA is not okay. So here you have a leadership which is essentially sacrificing its own people uh, for their religious war against autonomous Jews in Dar al Islam. Um, and here's the media siding not with the people who were the victims of it, namely the Palestinians and the Israelis, but siding with the Palestinian leadership who were the drivers of the war. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it depends on who you have empathy for. You know, if your selective empathy is for Yasser Arafat, if you're a BBC journalist and you're crying over the death of Yasser Arafat, you're an idiot. I would agree with you on that. Um, so I, I have a follow-up question, um, if you don't mind. So why is it then do you think that when uh, you know they do cry from the pulp in the Palestinian territories, kill the Jews every right. day, probably more than once, right. across the territories, right. and then the Israelis say in response, we want peace. Right. Let's 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 get this done. Right. Desperately want to live um, right. side by side. Right. Why is it that we don't believe the Jewish narrative, right. but we do believe the Palestinian narrative? It's the same narrative, same time, same day, and, yes. and it is very clear which side is being truthful and honest and which one is not. Well, first of all, it's not clear. Um, oh, sorry, maybe just to me. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> to you it's for, clear. For, to those of us who study this. To, the, we to the outsider who, you know, even if they've heard of fake news and so on, can't believe that there is pack journalism at work, yeah. pack lethal journalism mm -hmm. at work in the Arab-Israeli conflict and the reporting of it. Um, it's a different story, and one of the things is that the Western media systematically shields their viewers and readers from any exposure to what's going on in the Palestinian territories said in Arabic. Mm -hmm. So you don't hear about River to the Sea, and you don't hear about their irredentism and their unwillingness to compromise. All you hear is from Hanan Ashrawi saying, yes, we did, we've complied with this, we've done everything that we were asked to. No, they haven't done anything that they were asked to. Mm -hmm. And yet the reporters nod their heads and say, okay. So that's one, one aspect of it. The, the not reporting on the violence was particularly awful. I mean, there's one case that just it was mind-blowing, and it was right at the start of the Antifada. Um, 12 days after the Al-Dura affair and there were riots in Israel and riots in the Palestinian territories, um, there was the lynching in Ramallah, yes. 12th of October. Okay, and they were yelling revenge for the blood of Muhammad Adua. Okay, and um, the next day there was a preacher, uh, Halabiya I believe his name was, Sheikh Halabiya, who gave a sermon that was run on Palestinian TV and therefore picked up by Palestinian Media Watch, in which he said, labor could, they're all Jews, they're all the same, kill them wherever you see them, have no mercy, exterminate them everywhere, and their friends, the Americans, and etc. Okay, Kind of an important message yeah. to get out. So, William Orm, wife of the uh, Deborah Sontag, the the, the chief correspondent for the New York Times at the time, um, does a piece for the New York Times on is incitement to blame for the violence of the Antifada, okay? And he interviews the Palestinians and says, ah, oh, the Israelis, anything we say they consider incitement. And he interviews the Israelis who, among other things, show him this piece. The only piece of evidence that he gave for incitement on the Palestinian side was citing this piece, which he quoted as, and I quote, Labor could, they're all Jews, they're all the same, dot, 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 close quote. Now, you know, if, if I were a professor and I got a paper yes. from a student who was quoting a source yes. discussing incitement and left off the mm -hmm. genocidal stuff, I would say, I don't think you're cut out for this business. Mm -hmm. you know. mm -hmm. But... And, and that's been the case. I mean, Stephen Erlanger was there for years, did a whole thing about the lost generation of Palestinian youth without a word about this incitement. Mm -hmm. And to this day, you can't get. The only thing that the, the news reporters will do, Jody Rudorn, for example, got her arm twisted into doing a piece on Palestinian incitement um, in which she basically allowed the Israelis to say there's incitement, but did nothing 
to put that in her own voice. Mm -hmm. They'll constantly put Palestinian claims in their own voice. The vast majority of the casualties are civilian, et cetera, et cetera. They, they have no problem with repeating Palestinian talking points, but they don't repeat Israeli talking mm -hmm. points. No and and it's, problem, yeah. it's just, it's a catastrophe. So I've got um, just um, one more question before I would like to open it up to our viewing audience. So if you are watching us online, please feel free to start sending in your questions um, for Dr. Landis. Um, so we were speaking earlier, and I'd love for you to talk a little bit about the lethal narrative to our own game narrative. Um, our, and own role, goal. our own goal. Right, right, right. Our own goal narrative. Can't read my own handwriting here. Right. Um, and, and the role that that plays in, in the Hollywood. Well, it's really <laughs> obvious in the... Adura affair. I mean, you have this story of uh, a boy being killed by the Israelis, uh, according to the cameraman who took the pictures under oath, makes an affidavit saying it was in cold blood. Uh, you have Western lethal journalists like um, Robert Fisk saying, when I see uh, caught in a crossfire, I know the Israelis have been deliberately killing kids again. Right, so you you have um, this story spread on the level of the Arab-Palestinian conflict. It's a huge victory for the Palestinians. Swings sympathy to their side, fury against Israel, and so on. Big demonstrations. It opens the door to. It was a French journalist who said this uh, death erases, replaces the picture of the boy in the Warsaw ghetto. Right? I mean, it's hard to get more morally disoriented than to take the case of, at worst, a boy who was caught in a crossfire started by his own side, people firing from behind his back uh, at the Israelis, one boy, and have that replace a picture that symbolizes a systematic murder of a million kids and their parents? I mean, it's mind-boggling. Okay. So, um, so within the context of the Arab-Israeli conflict is very powerful, but as I said, you know, bin Laden picks it up right away. I spoke with a young man who was uh, uh, a Muslim who was radicalized at uh, a, a university in England mm -hmm. uh, during the, what I call the aughts, the first, gener first decade of the 21st century. And he said, oh, you know, they started with a tape of the al Dura affair. Mm -hmm. That's how they recruited jihad for jihad. So, you know, here's the West. It's not just spreading Palestinian war propaganda against Israel. And they consider Israel to be alien to them. Mm -hmm. They're spreading war propaganda of their own enemies, mm -hmm. people who are targeting them. So you go from lethal journalism to own goal war journalism, which is, you know, I, I don't know ever in the history of warfare that certainly for so sustained a period, we're now into 17 years of sustained own goal warfare in which journalists have systematically pervaded the enemy's war propaganda as news mm -hmm. to its own audiences. It's an astounding phenomenon. And, you know, I think to some extent, they see a lot of people, a lot of young millennials, for example, act as if Western civilization is uh, sort of invulnerable. Mm -hmm. they, can, they can bang away at it, they can criticize it, they can dump on it, they can scream at it, they can whatever they want, they mm -hmm. can do as much damage as they want to it, and it will still be there to protect their right to beat up on it. No, you know, we face a very serious enemy whom we systematically uh, underestimate. And, uh, you know, Western civilization is not guaranteed. Democracy, freedom, these are not guarantees. I used to tell my students, 1938 in Germany looked a lot different from 1942 Germany. And if you don't think four years, eight years, or ten years can bring down, um, you know, an empire or a right. democracy, well then you haven't read enough history books um, in your day. Right. So um, I'm going to take some questions from the audience right. now, if you don't mind. Um, yeah, and I'll get some water. Sure, I'm happy to get that for you. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. So our first question is, why do you think Hollywood finds such a willing audience in the West, despite contrary evidence? 
What is it about us in particular? I think the Europeans is easier to describe, and I hope you'll take those two questions, of European and Americans, because mm -hmm. um, I definitely think we're distinctly different in our acceptance right. of this narrative. Right. But what, what is it? What is intrinsic to the Western okay. democratic values that right. makes us so amicable? Right. So initially, what I did was, um, I thought in terms of Europeans and Holocaust guilt. I, I just published a piece in the tablet on the difference between Holocaust guilt and Holocaust shame. Um, and the thing about shame is you you're feel bad because you've been caught and everybody knows you did wrong. Um, and the most important thing is to not be shamed. And if you can shift that shame to somebody else, like Israel, um, how much the better. So initially I thought that it had to do with, you know, a, 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 a shunting of Holocaust guilt, like that comment, this picture erases, replaces the picture of the or so get a boy. Um, what I've come to understand is that there is an enormous appetite for stories about Jews behaving badly. Yeah. That's a great name for a documentary, Jews Behaving Badly. Jews Behaving <laughs> Badly. In other words, you know, Palestinians behaving badly, yawn. Of course they behave badly, and of course we understand that, you know, it's their resistance right. and so on. Reaction to right. oppression. What, what my friend Manfred Gerstenfeld calls humanitarian racism, mm -hmm. right? The low expectations. Uh, so on the one hand there's that, but the appetite for stories about Jews behaving badly is really quite astounding. Um, there's a joke, uh, there's a movie about this, uh, these Jews who were in an Australian uh, prison camp during World War II because they're German. So they were in an Australian prison camp. Yeah, and at one point the Jew is explaining to the head of the British, head of the concentration camp or Australian, and he says, you know what anti-Semitism is? Anti-Semitism is hating Jews more than absolutely necessary. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... Um, the 21st century version of that is anti-Semitism is hating Jews even when it hurts you. Mm -hmm. And that's what's going on here is this, this appetite for stories of Jews behaving badly is killing the West. It's the un soft underbelly through which uh, uh, the, what I call the caliphators, the, one, the people who want to establish a global caliphate, have invaded Europe and they've invaded the West. Now, most recently my thinking has gone in this direction. What is the source of a lot of anti-Semitism? It's got to do, or let's call it Jew hatred. Mm -hmm. um, it's got to do with what the Christians called supersessionism, which is we, initially, we Christians, ha have the true faith, and we have therefore replaced the Jewish Jews as true Israel, veros Israel, um, and we are the true chosen people, and in order for us to be chosen, here's the zero-sum logic, the Jews have to be unchosen. Uh, and therefore, anything bad that either happens to the Jews, like Roman defeats, or bad behavior on the part of the Jews, you know, just fills us with joy at our superiority to them. And then the Muslims come along and use supersessionism against the Christians as well as the Jews. What I think we're dealing with today is the global progressive left, people like Judith Butler and uh, Tony Judd in his day and uh, uh, a lot of uh, figures who believe that they're leading the, the global progressive left. There are a lot of people at The Nation magazine, for example. Um, they believe that they have their own supersessionist narrative. Now, in the normal, in the monotheistic supersessionist narrative, God favors me more than he favors the Jews. In this one, there's no God. So how do you get your moral superiority? By putting Israel down. So in response to Janine, we have uh, Roed Larson, the hero of mm -hmm. this uh, play right now, Oslo. Um, who says Israel has lost all moral high ground. Mm -hmm. Wow. But what does that mean? It means that we are morally superior. A. Not Wolf did a very good mm -hmm. piece on this. We are, it's the white man's burden. We are the moral leaders of the universe and we get to piss down 
on the Israelis. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's a fantasy, but it's an enormously attractive fantasy, this fantasy of moral Sweden, moral Europe, mm -hmm. moral Germany. They all feel that they're morally superior to Israel, and they feed that vanity with stories about Jews behaving badly. Of course, the greater irony being that all of these countries are founded on the moral premise of Judeo-Christian values. So the morality to which they are, um, you know, espousing these views right. extends from the actual right. governments that are founded on the basis of our faith. Um, so we've got some more questions um, from the audience. Um, I'd love to um, ask you this one. Does Israeli journalism do mm -hmm. a satisfactory job of countering <laughs> Hollywood? And I think we, we know how to answer that, but I'd love to hear your question, I mean, your answer. Um, and does the Israeli government stop such efforts in any way? Look, um, let me start with the Israeli government because I, I, I ran into enormous problems getting the Israelis to deal with uh, Mohammed Adura and basically until very late, until 2013 when um, Yossi Kuperwasser's report came out basically saying that it was staged. Um, until then, the Israeli government wanted nothing to do with this. Uh, I remember talking to one spokesman for the IDF who said to me, um, do you believe it's fake? And I said, yeah, I do. And she said, that's it. There's nothing to talk about. That's a conspiracy theory. I don't want to have anything to do with you. So, uh, and, and I don't think that this was malicious. I think mm -hmm. she was trying to protect her credibility mm -hmm. because she was living in an atmosphere in which you know, you already had this sort of moral hysteria of if you deny it, um, then, you know, you're an awful person. Uh, in fact, I gave a talk at the IDC and an Arab student came up to me afterwards and said, why hasn't Israel said this to the Arab world? You know, I grew up thinking that you targeted this kid and that you wanted to kill him. Why haven't you defended yourself? And I said, look, because if Israel had tried to defend itself, the cry would have been blaming the victim and made it even worse. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's what Nidra, Nidra has a very subtle, Nidra Polar has a very subtle analysis of lethal narratives and the way in which once they get laid out, once they've, once they've taken, it's almost impossible to reverse mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. And yet, I would argue, until you start reversing them, until the Western media acknowledges that 17 years ago they had a massive failure, which for the last 17 years they've been unwilling to re-examine, we will continue to, you know, any efforts to change is like painting on dirty surfaces. The paint's not going to take. You've, you've got to clean out what I call, my blog is called the Augean Stables. You've got to clean out the Augean Stables. It, the, the media is so encrusted with bad practices, and they already were at the time that I started my blog in 2005, but today, with the impact of the internet and the dropping of serious journalists and the sort of move to clickbait and the, mm -hmm. the power of Google and Facebook to move uh, news stories and stuff, um, it's even worse, it's not better. It seems strange then that people wouldn't be more receptive to your narrative about Hollywood given the rise of this false flag narrative online right. and this rise of this conspiracy theories online where people just see it everywhere and here you're actually saying it's not a conspiracy, it's actually happening, right. there's real tangible evidence of this going on unlike some of the, the crazier videos that people see about mass shootings or terrorist attacks here in America right. and, but right. they're not receptive right. when these Israelis are right. the, the victims. Right, so uh, I mean you would think that, but one of the things that I've learned, much to my dismay, uh, is uh, there's a great line, I forget who made it, I think it's Charles Piggy, no, somebody else made a great line which was, it's easier to sway a thousand people with rhetoric mm -hmm. than to influence one person with logic, mm -hmm. with reason. So uh, reasoning this thing out is difficult. What I think we need to do is to create First, a narrative that points out the self-destructive consequences of this behavior. Mm -hmm. And that would sort of clear the way for the awareness of this fake news and its impact mm -hmm. on people. Because otherwise, you know, it's just, it's so complicated. It's so, you get bogged down in so many arguments and there's so many accusations 
that you know no matter how many of them you refute there's always more mm -hmm. it's like you know the Palestinians say the Israelis killed 72 people in a bombing of Kafar Kana right mm -hmm. and it turns out it's 23 mm -hmm. and it turns out that most of them but you know it's all right so it's 23 you killed 23 people yeah. you didn't kill 76 you know? yeah. so it's just um, I, I think people need to understand that first of all Israel is democracy's best ally in the Middle East that that for Western democracies to turn their back on Israel and to sort of uh, appease uh, the what, what's it called, the Office of Islamic Conference or something? Mm -hmm. Yes. 52 mm -hmm. Muslim Honestly, nations yep. to appease them rather than to say to them, you know, you've you got to come to grips with this. If you can't get along with the Israelis, you can't get along with us. And we need some evidence that you're willing to live with infidels in peace. Yeah. Um, until the West is ready to do that, and the evidence is not very good, um, this will go on. I like your point about it's self-destructive. When I traveled to Israel for the first time when I was a teenager in yeah. 1996, uh -huh. the program that I went on allowed us to spend a weekend on the beach with Palestinians. And uh -huh. each person was teamed up with one person. We uh -huh. spent three days living okay. together and talking and hanging out. Wow. And I remember the first thing that the person I had teamed up with mm -hmm. asked me was, why do you hate me? And I said, well, I don't. Why do you hate me? And right. he said, well, I don't. Okay, and we had the best weekend ever, and then we right. all hung on the beach. That program doesn't exist anymore well, because of where we are. Well, right. I can guarantee you, you can trace that program. Mm -hmm. and then oh, I absolutely. remember I had an Israeli graduate student working with me, and she had a best friend, in um, a Muslim friend that she had made at the university in Israel, and um, after two th after the Aldura incident, she called up her friend and her friend said, "I can't talk to you." Mm -hmm. you're I think it's happened to probably a lot forbidden. of us. Yep. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, it's 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 catastrophic, and the journalists are just so smug and so self that pleased with themselves. That brings me actually perfect segue to our next question from um, Sasha, I believe, and it says, um, "Do media agencies actually guide their journalists to spread these lies? Do you think this is an active?" participatory, you know, yeah, um, right. narrative that comes from the top right. down. Having worked in a newsroom, I do know that narratives come from top down. The stories yeah. that journalists hand in at the end of the day, at the five o'clock deadline, are not necessarily what I would see the right. next morning when I woke up, despite my name being on exactly, it. Exactly, exactly. Particularly the headlines, which is what 80% of people Working at the New York Post, we were good at headlines. Right. <laughs> so, um, look, there's no question that it goes from the bottom up and the top down. In other words, the journalists on the scene, and this is true even of Fox journalists, mm -hmm. are under serious intimidation and therefore are not going to contradict the Palestinians in any significant way. Um, so you get it from the bottom up, but you also get it from the top down. In other words, I've spoken to journalists who say, I, had, I wanted to do this story, I wanted to do that story, and I was basically told by my editor, no, we won't, do, we won't run that story. I had the experience, I went to WGBH in Boston with uh, Pallywood stuff, and I'm speaking with an Israeli, or an ex-Israeli, who's uh, you know, one of the editors there, and I show him this stuff, and I said, would you do this? He said, only if we can find something that the Israelis did that's parallel. Right. And I said, so if you can't find something that the Israelis did that's parallel, you won't do it? He said, that's right. So, uh, so there's, it comes from both directions. Mm -hmm. Mati Friedman did a mm -hmm. series of uh, excellent pieces, yeah. one in the Atlantic, uh, one in Fathom magazine, and I forget where the other one was, but he, he did some really excellent pieces, and he said, look, I'm working for AP, and we've got pictures of, you know, Palestinian stormtroopers uh, demonstrating at a Palestinian university, and the editor won't run it. You know, just like Steve Allinger, until he went to France and then he did a piece that was sort of about it, wouldn't talk about intimidation mm -hmm. because if you talk about intimidation, they're not going to like you. Mm -hmm. uh, I talked with a Palestinian, a, a, a British journalist, Mark Seeger, who was at Janine, got beat up, his camera was destroyed, and so on. Um, and he wrote a, a piece, and he was pro, pro, pro Palestinian. And he wrote a piece about how, you know, he'll have nightmares for the rest of his life, and he described what happened and stuff. He gets a call the next day from a friend saying, you're not safe anymore. 
you better leave here. And so, you know, the, the intimidation works at both levels. Why did the New York Times not publish the picture of Charlie Hebdo uh, in 2015, right. you know, with mm-hmm. the Mohammed with the tear up. and so on? Um, and a bunch of other papers in the States did, and they were reproached for this. And the response of the editor-in-chief was, look, these other papers can do it. They don't have journalists around the world who are vulnerable, mm-hmm. so they can afford to do these things. Mm-hmm. But we have to worry about reprisal. So they have these sentences. I'm used to it because I'm a medievalist. So you get somebody who's writing a piece in which he denounces uh, uh, taking interest. Um, medieval thinker, churchman, denounces taking interest, and then in the middle of it, he's got an argument for taking interest, mm-hmm. right? But he concludes with, mm-hmm. so here are these guys who are saying, this is the reason why, uh, not spelling it out, but basically anybody who knows how to read can understand what's going on, and then concludes by, we stick to the highest in impartial standards of journalism. What? You just told me you didn't. Yeah. So we're, we're gearing up. We have only got a few minutes left, so I'd like to kind of combine really quickly this last question um, into one from Moshe and Tomer. So um, Tomer asks, you know, how can we expose this? How can we expose the Photoshop images, the, 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 the fake videos, and is there legal capacity to do anything? And Moshe asks, um, really more broadly, how can we, can we as the public or the press, how can we change this narrative? Wow. I know, it's a big question for only two minutes, all right, but so listen, you're a great professor, I'll, I'll so you, I know you can do all it. All right, <laughs> well, I'll tell you my fantasy, um, and that is that whether or not we win, and I don't know what body, I'm not a lawyer, although at one point I wanted to be, um, we need to, uh, I think it would be interesting to do a class action suit against the media. Oh, wow for the systematic abuse of the trust of the public. They, there is no question that they are systematically violating professional commitments, Absolutely. both in the making of the mistakes and the refusal to correct the right. mistakes. The damage can be literally seen, for instance, in 2014, uh, there was this terrible incident where 10 kids were killed in Shati refugee camp because it was there was a truce between the Israelis and the Palestinians, and it was the day, the end of Ramadan, and they were allowed out for the first day, and they're playing, and they get hit by a shell. It came from Hamas. Okay, it was reported as an Israeli shell by BBC. Blah blah blah. Um, that case led to a clear uptick in violence against Jews in England. You can you can corro- you can correlate, it, yeah. correlate the the bad reporting and the violence in Europe, not mm-hmm. just violence in in the Middle East, to this. Yeah. So you know uh, Emile Zola wrote Jacques mm-hmm. about the Dreyfus affair. I think we should write Nous accusons. We accuse, we accuse the press not just of trashing us, but trashing their own profession, Mm -hmm. and in the process, seriously weakening Western societies. Well, those of us who've worked in high-stress newsrooms have often heard, as long as it's true at the 5 o'clock deadline, it doesn't really matter if it's true tomorrow. Right, Um, right, right. right. So I want to, before we we finish up, I want to thank you for being with us today. I know that the entire JD Corps, I speak for us when we say we're thrilled to have you here. I personally am thrilled to have a conversation with you again. I I find no greater joy than getting to sit and talk to you. Um, And before we um, sign off online today with our viewers, I'm wondering if you could just quickly tell us where we can learn more about you, websites, social media, books available on Amazon, right. how can we engage you, and how can our viewers engage you? All right, so um, I have a blog, yep. uh, the AugeanStables.com. It's a great all blog. All one word. Um, and most of the stuff that I publish goes up there sometimes in a longer version before it was cut for the thousand word crowd. Um, <laughs> Um, and with more links than most uh, magazines Lots of good and links publications in like to put in. Um, there's also a site called The Second Draft, which is mm-hmm. an older site, really needs to be updated. 
um, where you can, for example, see the raw footage of Pallywood. You can see the stuff uh, that, that I, I used to make the movie. Because uh, I believe in transparency, you know, people should see your sources. Mm -hmm. That's what we historians believe. Um, so those two uh, are places to become accustomed. I have a site called Aldura.com, which unfortunately is not up right now. I have to get it up, and that's got a lot of the material about Aldura. But so does Second Draft. It's mm -hmm. just in an older form. Um, and uh, um, listen, if I can use this occasion, let me answer your question, I'd give you a different answer to your question. There are a gazillion Palestinian civil society organizations, at least. Often, <laughs> often run by one person, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But then they all sign it, and it's very impressive, and mm -hmm. you know, a thousand civil society organizations all say this. Mm -hmm. um, people who have funded Western, people who have funded pro-Israel uh, work, have a tendency to say, well, you know, what you're doing sounds a lot like this, why don't you go work with them, right? Mm -hmm. And so let's, you know, let's not reinvent the wheel. No, we should be reinventing the wheel a thousand ways. People like Elder of Zion, mm -hmm. uh, at the blog Elder of Zion, mm -hmm. he should be paid yes. to do that full time mm -hmm. rather than on the train back home after work, mm -hmm. right? Um, I should be funded to do the kind of stuff that I'm doing because essentially nobody knows what and when the discourse that we're trying to articulate will take. And there should be as many people who are enabled to speak out on this stuff as possible. And so, yes, I would say one of the ways to go, and I'd be happy to hear from people who want to help me with my work. Uh, I record CNN and BBC 24-7. I'm about to come out with a piece on how they covered the UN Security Council resolution and Kerry's speech at the end of 2016, which is an astoundingly stupid performance on their part. Um, uh, yes, fun people who are fighting back instead of, you know, sitting around saying, well, you know, I'm not sure you meet, uh, take a chance. Well, you heard it here first. We need to fund um, <laughs> Dr. Landis's work. Perhaps maybe we could talk about that off camera with uh, right. our friends here at the World Jewish Congress. Right. So thank you so much for joining us today. We are incredibly grateful for all those of you that tuned in and everywhere around the world. Feel free to reach out to the World Jewish Congress by visiting us online and uh, definitely check out Dr. Landis's stuff. I'm Melissa Jane Kronfeld with the World Jewish Congress JD Corps, and we hope you have a fantastic rest of the week. Are we off?